Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Melissa Domina, the Communications and Legal Officer for the International Commission of Jurists Africa Program. It gives me great pleasure to facilitate this conversation alongside my colleague, ICJ Legal Advisor on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, Tim Fitch Hodgson, and one of our latest commissioners to join the fold, Global Director of the Shift, Leilani Farah. I'll leave her and Tim to introduce themselves properly, but first of all, I just want to say that I am incredibly grateful to you, Leilani, for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us today to talk through us to talk us through this very important development in the housing movement. So the reason why we're having this chat today is to, of course, welcome our new commissioner. But um, also earlier on this month, Leilani's organization, The Shift, had released the first ever set of directives on the financialization of housing in the European Parliament. This groundbreaking human rights framework is a huge leap forward in the, in the movement on the right to housing, offering practical human rights based solutions for governments and investors. And they are a critical tool for housing and human rights advocates to assert the right to housing. Leilani will talk us through why this is an important step forward, as well as sharing with us a little bit more about her work in the field. If you have any questions or comments, please do type them in the comments section and we'll address them at the end. Also, please let us know where you're joining us from, um, what you do, as well as your interest in the topic. We'd love to hear from you. So before my colleague and I get to the questions that we have for Leilani, I will, as I mentioned, invite both of them to give us a brief introduction about themselves. So um, please just let everybody know a little bit about your roles and then we will dive straight into it. Tim, you can go first and then Leilani, um, you can go directly afterwards, please. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, I, my name is Tim Hodgson. I am uh, working for the ICJ based mostly in Johannesburg, but I'm currently sitting in the Geneva office. Um, I'm the ICJ's global lead on economic, social and cultural rights um, and work across the world uh, on a range of rights, including the right to housing. Um, so thanks for that introduction. I think we can move on. Yes, we can. Leilani, please go forward if you can. Just a second. Not sure what's happening here. <laughs> Apologies, everybody. Some technical difficulties, as is <laughs> the case sometimes with these live sessions. Um, for some reason, I'm not able to unmute you, Leilani. Just let me just see if I can resolve this. I think, okay, let's give this a try. I think we should be able to hear you now. Let me see, can you hear me now? There we go. Well, I'm having a terrible echo and I have a feeling I have two windows open. Um, so I'm not sure what to do about that, but I will try to resolve it after I introduce myself. I'm Leilani. I am um, the global director of The Shift, an international um, human rights organization that focuses squarely on housing and finance. Um, I am the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing, a post I held from 2014 until 2020. And I am a newly minted, fairly newly minted commissioner at the ICJ, a real honor and, and a pleasure. And it's, I want to just say it's a real honor and pleasure to be in conversation with you this, well, for me, it's this morning, this afternoon and this evening for others. Um, I think this is an important conversation. So maybe we should get to it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, both of you for those um, incredible introductions. Um, I think we'll just dive right into it then. So first and foremost, Leilani, welcome to the ICJ. We are incredibly honored to have you in our organization, and I'm sure that you're going to um, lend your expertise to us in a very meaningful and very impactful way. Um, please let me know, first and foremost, what drew you to becoming an ICJ commissioner? And how do you hope to bring your experiences as an executive director of, of various NGOs, as well as the UN Special Rapporteur on, on the Right to Housing, and as Global Director of The Shift to this role? Thanks for the question. Um, well, to be honest, I was approached by the ICJ to see if I was interested in being a commissioner. And I had never thought of it. Um, to be honest, I actually never thought of myself um, to be of the caliber of some of the commissioners, to, to be honest. Um, 
uh, I don't know, that's maybe just says something about me. Um, in any event, the ICJ is a very highly regarded, well established organization you know, dating back to the early 50s, if I recall correctly, I think is when it was formed. And um, really, you know, clearly a human rights organization, interested in the rule of law. And I felt when I was approached, and I still feel this way, that the human rights framework, as fragile as it is, and as underutilized as it is, still is the most important framework we have in order for us to have more just and happier and more peaceful societies. I can't, I mean, I look, I'm always on the lookout for other frameworks that can do what I think needs to be done to make the world a better place. And I continuously come back to the human rights framework. The only other frameworks I've seen that, um, maybe parallel, um, are Indigenous frameworks. And the thing about Indigenous frameworks is, um, first of all, they're not for me to appropriate. <laughs> so I, I, I can't do that. But I do try to work in some of um, the ideas that come from Indigenous rights movements into the human rights framework, because they're very compatible. And I think the human rights framework only benefits from Indigenous rights frameworks. But beyond that, I can't find another framework that is as useful. And the ICJ is a stalwart. Now, I also thought, okay, the ICJ is a big deal, super important entity. But it too, like human rights law, needs to come along. It needs to be seized with the issues of the day. And I think I happen to be working right now on one of the issues of the day, which is the financialization of housing. We could expand that out and say the financialization of everything, uh, but it happens that I work in the area of housing that I that is, as far as social and economic rights go, it's very fundamental. It's, it's tantamount to the right to life in the ICCPR, in the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. I think they're very parallel rights because without housing, we know that the right to life is jeopardized. So, so it's for that mix of reasons um, that I thought this is a really wonderful opportunity. And, and also for me to meet other commissioners and the staff at the ICJ who are leaders in the human rights world. So for, for, for me, uh, uh, I appreciate your answer. And I think that part of the reason why we were so keen on having you as a commissioner at the ICJ is precisely because of the dynamism uh, in thinking about human rights advocacy that you bring. Um, and uh, for us who are working on economic and social rights at the ICJ, we are always happy to have commissioners who want to support the work to eliminate poverty and inequality everywhere in the world, however we go about that. Um, the question is, and, and I think that this we all have a different answer to this, um, how did you originally end up, you've given part of an answer to why you think homelessness in particular and housing is so important, but how did you begin to get into housing work and, and how did this become a focus in the first place before we get to the financialization of housing issues? Yeah, so um, I actually have almost exclusively worked on the right to housing throughout my entire career. And I'm pretty old now. So I've been kicking around for about 25 years, uh, working almost exclusively on the right to housing. And I got into it because I had to do a work placement for a combined degree I was doing uh, way back. I did a, a master's uh, in social work and a law degree um, at the same time. It was a joint program. And the requirement was to work somewhere. And I chose to work at a human rights organization in Toronto focused on housing. Um, I knew I was interested in housing I, for a variety of reasons. Um, and probably related to my kind of ancestry. My father um, describes himself as um, a person without a home. Uh, he uh, grew up in southern Lebanon. His lands, his family lands were in northern, what is now northern Israel. Um, and as a result of um, a whole confluence of things, he ended up emigrating to Canada and um, always considers himself a man without without a land and without a home. And so maybe that 
played something in my thinking. In any event, I did this placement and um, I ended up through um, a bunch of fortuitous things, uh, spending a summer in East Jerusalem. And uh, as it happened, the then special rapporteur on the right to housing, appointed by a, a body at the UN that doesn't even exist anymore, the Subcommission on Human Rights, um, came to Palestine, uh, to East Jerusalem, and I was responsible for being the liaison between Palestinian NGOs and this special rapporteur. And I mean, it was from there that I just got completely hooked on the, at the time, the embryonic idea that housing is a human right, that it's it's fully recognized in international law, that it means something, et cetera. And it all, it all flowed from there. Incredible. That's um. It's such, so great to be able to kind of like have you trace your trajectory in that way, and to to be where you're at right now. I think is just yeah. It's it's so so incredible. Um. So I think to take it you know, back to I guess well to the financialization issue. Please tell us a little bit more about your organization, the Shift, because that is essentially an organization that is working on advocating for the right to housing. So how did that come about? Um. How did um, the organization form? And um, what other advocacy work around the right to housing um, along with the shift? What other projects are you um, engaged in currently? Yeah, so so the shift is really an outgrowth of my work as UN rapporteur. Um, whilst I was rapporteur, uh, in fact, quite early on, it became clear to me that the right to housing didn't have the currency that I thought it should even within the international system, human rights system, where you would expect, I mean, it's one of the most articulated social and economic rights. And it, um, there's people on the ground, I mean, Tim and Melissa, you will know, people on the ground everywhere, every country fighting for the right to housing. Certainly South Africa is, you know, one of, one of the, the main places. And yet... It just didn't seem to have currency. I, a lot of people were, when I became rapporteur in 2014, people were talking about the right to water, the right to water, right to water. And I just thought, well, you know, the right to water is so intrinsically and integrally related to the right to housing. What ha What's happened to the right to housing? So I knew early on that we needed more than just a rapporteur and more than just all these domestic organizations, that we needed a kind of global movement. And I, I just had that as a idea. And through the mandate, that idea sort of caught on. And when we went to the um, UN Habitat, I'm um, sorry, the Habitat 3 conference on the um, new urban agenda, we hosted a meeting and we had to come up with a name for the meeting. So we just called it Make the Shift or The Shift or something like that. And we invited people to come and talk about um, the right to housing and the idea of a global movement. And we had booked a room, a space for 100 people. There was standing room only. It was completely packed. There were diverse stakeholders there, grassroots movements, funders, academics, NHRA, National Human Rights Institutions, NGOs, uh, you know, UN folks. And so we thought, wait a second. Okay, this, is, this has some currency. People like this idea. And from there, the shift was born. It was actually born whilst I was UN rapporteur. So the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, as well as an international network of cities, and me as rapporteur joined together and we launched it. And then we realized, well, my mandate was ending. And we asked, we started to ask the question, is this worth continuing? And if if I'd been given the big red light, I wouldn't have opened the shift. But there was like a green light and a kind of flag waving, please do this, do this, don't don't abandon the project. So uh, so the shift was born right at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I'll just sorry, Tim, just to say some of the work that we're doing besides obviously I have a big piece on the financialization of housing. I just um release the shift directives, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, but uh, we're all, we also have a big chunk of work looking at the right to housing and climate change 
and financialization and sort of linking those. And we'll be releasing a big report about um, that uh, in the fall. Um, we also just do some support work, like organizations on the ground that need support for something that they're trying to push. So in fact, we've done um, some supportive work in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, um, in parts of Latin America, uh, certainly in Canada. Um, and we're, we also have a Canada-based project where we're working with cities. We intended for this to be international, but because of the pandemic, we ended up focusing on Canada because we couldn't travel anywhere um, and build those relationships. And, you know, you need those face-to-face. -face, I don't care what anyone says. You need face-to-face -face meetings to really build relationships. Um, so we have a project working with city governments in Canada to help them understand what the right to housing means and to implement it at the local level. This is a very cool project that we hope to be able to scale uh, globally uh, because so much housing activity happens at that local level. And so thanks, thanks, Leilani. I think that also interesting there for maybe some of the people listening, particularly the South African audience, is that the work that you're referring to is support work for Ndifuna Okwazi and other organizations in Cape Town. Um, and the ICJ is busy working on also partnering with the same organizations, a report which we hope will come out sometime in the next few months. Um, basically about the manipulation and abuse of the city's bylaws at a local level exactly. to subvert their domestic and international human rights law obligations. Um, Melissa is currently based in Cape Town, so she's at the scene of the crime right now. Um, but the question that I have so that we so that we don't uh, scare people away um, in w even working in the environment now, uh, there are many terms that are thrown around for different rights. So we talk about the commercialization of healthcare, the privatization of education. Uh, can you explain to us specifically what financialization and then the financialization of housing means? Um, I'm aware that it's in your directives, but uh, just for people who don't know and aren't as familiar. No, absolutely. And it, it is important to define it. And it's important for people to hear how I define it, because I don't define it. I, I have a very particular definition. Uh, and it, my definition is ad admittedly strategic, and we can talk about that. But um, so when I'm talking about the financialization, I'm, I'm talking about a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, and I would date it post-global financial crisis in particular. Not that it doesn't have its roots in neoliberalism, which it absolutely does, which of course comes from the late 70s and early 80s and throughout the 80s and 90s. Um, and until this, until today, neoliberalism is still the dominant framework um, um, being used. So that's its roots. But where I date it is from the global financial crisis. And the way I define it is where housing is used at, principally as a financial instrument, a tool, a place to park, grow, leverage, and hide capital, but unprecedented amounts of capital. So if you, if you think about that definition, what I generally am not talking about is home ownership, which is, of course, a form of commodification of housing. Most home ownership schemes involve mortgages. Mortgage, mortgage it, that's just a financial instrument. It's that a mortgage isn't a house. A mortgage is a financial instrument that attaches to a home. And mortgages definitely fuel economies and, and uh, fuel household economies as well as uh, national economies. That's not actually what I'm talking about. It Sometimes financialization will dovetail with that, where we see, for example, these big financial actors purchasing single family homes and turning them into rentals that are too expensive for most people. The actors that I focus on, in other words, are not the individual homeowner. The actors I focus on are the big private equity firms who get their money from pension funds, for example, insurance companies, um, asset management firms I also focus on, endowments. Um, I haven't gone down that road as much as I would like yet, but that's coming. Um, so we're talking about the actors who control uber amounts of money and who are using housing as a financial instrument and have their principal... Um, they would say their fiduciary duty is to shareholders, not tenants. And that therein lies part of the problem. Um, 
when I look at financialization, I'm looking at very particular practices. Um, there's actually a business model in place. People say, oh, well, this business model was in place before the global financial crisis, but not to the depth and extent that it's being used and done now. So I'm talking principally about um, the the mass purchasing of units. It's often, um, it can be an entire neighborhood, for example, of homes that are then converted into, as I said, expensive rentals. It can be social housing that's purchased and then converted to market-based housing at expensive rates. It can be multifamily buildings, so like apartment buildings, um, that are then converted into more expensive rentals. It often involves destabilizing people's homes through construction that's unnecessary, renovations. People call them renovictions in some jurisdictions. Um, so it's business practices the aim of which is to maximize profits off of every square meter or square foot of property for shareholders, for the benefit of shareholders, and as a vehicle for leveraging more capital. I hope yes, that was so, clear. No, it's very clear. Um, yeah. But I think just to give uh, people listening before, sorry, Melissa, uh, the, the, this is a phenomenon which is, if my understanding is correct, in the majority of cases happening in big cities um in urban areas maybe you could say something about that and also give a few examples of places where you've witnessed witnessed particularly bad or documented particularly bad uh, examples sure it is happening in in big cities but increasingly also in what we might call secondary cities so um because big cities are so especially in uh the the uh, northern western countries because big cities are becoming so expensive and impossible to live in, a lot of people are then migrating to secondary cities and so is private equity and so is this this capital that I'm talking about. Um, so we're seeing it pop up in all sorts of areas. It's also very prominent in touristed areas. So it could be a small city, like you take the city of Porto in Lisbon, it's fairly small, um, but financialization is really rooted there. Barcelona is not a big city. Well, maybe people consider it a big city, but it's actually not that big. Um, lots of... Um, um, you know, all throughout Greece, for example, islands, you see financialization in it in a particular form happening there. Um, so just to say this is this is kind of everywhere. Um, some of the most recent and scary examples I've seen have come out of Mexico, for example, um, where of course, it's a very touristed place. And now this is an interesting thing where you're seeing the dovetailing of the effects of the pandemic with financialization. And by that, I mean, um, so because of the pandemic, it became clear that lots of people could work from almost anywhere. And so what you what what Mexico saw were a lot of North Americans living in places like Chicago, cold, maybe Toronto, or where I'm from, Ottawa, super cold, going to a place like Mexico for periods of time, because they could work there. And so what we're what what Mexico has seen in in Guadalajara for example and other places is the proliferation of tourist oriented housing. So investment in big buildings that are not culturally appropriate and that stand is that can stand empty but that are really intended not for the local population and are intended for touristification or for tourists. That's a, a newer newer phenomenon. Um, one of the scariest things that happened um, during the pandemic has just been the kind of saturation of private equity uh, and other uh, actors, pension funds in the residential real estate market throughout the United States, for example, huge, massive purchases of multifamily apartment buildings. We ha You have to understand in the North American market, multifamily apartment buildings are often the only affordable housing available. Um, North America has very low rates of social housing, not, not, not dissimilar from uh, Cape Town, for example, um, not enough social housing for need. And people are living in apartment buildings that are, you know, barely able to make ends meet. Those apartment buildings, including the ones that are actually deemed affordable, um, 
are being purchased and the rents are being raised. People are being evicted at alarming rates and rents are being raised. So um, Blackstone is one of the biggest actors in that regard. Um, they, uh, at the end of 2021, they were boasting historic profits, historic in the last 20 years historic profits. And they said the bulk of those profits were coming from their investments in residential real estate. They're one of the most aggressive I and mean, private equity tends to be more aggressive than even asset management um, because they need to go in to a deal and extract profits quickly and get out. That's how private equity works. It's at, at most a 10 year time frame. So they've got to get in. It's often five years, get in, reap profits and get out. And so they're very aggressive in their, in their methodologies and their business practices. Hence Blackstone saying that they've had this incredibly lucrative. So think about that though, 2021, most people were suffering, not able to have gainful employment, fearful of a deadly virus. And meanwhile, these guys are reaping in the profits and boasting incredible returns. Much, much like the big education technology companies and the pharmaceutical companies um, that have been profiting throughout the pandemic. And exactly. Even and rest assured, Blackstone has huge stakes in the health, healthcare and pharmaceuticals. So um, they're everywhere. Yeah. I'll throw this out just for later, but I, I don't want to keep Melissa a little bit longer, but there's some examples which will interest uh, South African audiences also, which come up from the directives, which are examples like uh, massive investments for student accommodation, which is uh, a problem in, in existence in Africa too. And then also the very familiar and recognizable uh, Airbnb uh, trends towards massive investments into large numbers of houses for touristification as you describe it but uh, maybe you can mention those uh, talk a little bit more to that sure sure yeah and thanks for the nudge one forgets all of the different ways in which financialization manifests and just so people understand why we include airbnb or short-term rental platforms and um, student accommodation in in the notion of financialization um, we know that though there are people who rent you know, a room from their house as an Airbnb unit. It Airbnb has become a form of investment. Sometimes entire buildings are purchased for short-term lets or short-term rentals. Um, Airbnb itself mar markets itself as a good form of investment. And so we wanted to include it. Um, we've seen entire neighborhoods wiped out by Airbnb units. Airbnb eats up what could be, or short-term rentals, eats up what could be long-term rental accommodation for people in need who actually live in cities and who actually make cities work and run cities, right? From teachers to nurses to baristas to, you know, janitors, etc. So, so that's the problem with um, short-term rentals. Uh, if you look at a map of Athens, for example, it's shocking. You'll look at a map of Athens and see the penetration of Airbnb. There's one low-income neighborhood, uh, the name of which I can't remember, that that was 70% low-income people living there and is now 70% Airbnb. I mean, it's just displacing populations. It's it's deeply disturbing. The other day I was looking at a map of Airbnb in New Orleans, obviously a big tourist destination for many. It's crazy. Look at a map of London. I mean, it's quite out of control. Um, in terms of student accommodation, <laughs> this is being marketed as the newest asset class. It, it's marketed as an asset class unto itself. So it's... It, in that the world of finance, it's differentiated from residential real estate. It is understood as a sure bet investment. Why? Because there will always be students and students will always have parents who pay their rent. And so student accommodation has become huge prey for private equity. Uh, in particular, there are a couple of companies uh, running around. Graystar is one of them. And um, um, Black, I think Blackstone is in, engaged in student housing. But the what we have to understand about the impact of private equity and the financialization of student housing 
is more than just making it expensive for students to rent. What happens then is low-income students who tend to come from marginalized populations have to then try to find accommodation that's further away from the university or college that they're attending. And they often are the students who also have part-time jobs trying to pay their way through college or university. So they have the double whammy of living far away from campus because that's the only place they can afford, sometimes living in cars, I've heard as well, but living far away from campus and having part-time jobs, making it that much more difficult for them to find time to study and therefore possibly producing poorer outcomes which then just reinforces their own marginalization. So it's it's actually a huge equality issue um, that really isn't on the radar of too many folks, which is why we included it in, in, in the shift directives. Well, thank you, Leilani and Tim. I think that you've quite quite well laid out through these very, these very different um, examples and rather scary examples of, well, of just these very exploitative practices and essentially just using profits over people and given us a very clear picture of the devastating impact um, of financialization on people on the ground. And so I think this is a good, um, a good point at which we can talk about the shift directives and where they come into helping to resolve these kinds of issues. Do you mind walking us through the development of the directives and the purpose of them and what you hope to achieve with them? I do mind walking you through the development of them because it, it will bring back painful memories. <laughs> As anyone knows who's tried to do something of this nature, um, it's not an easy task and um, one pulls out their hair, although I, I still have a fair bit, but... Um, in the process, but it was an amazing process actually. So I was um, offered a, a fellowship with the Open Society Foundation, foundations, um, and the, the big product that I was gonna produce are these directives. And so um, I spent about a year researching and, or maybe a year and a half, you know, about a year, researching and drafting um, the shift directives uh, with a small team through the shift. And um, I ended up with this massive document. It was like crazy long document. And I decided, okay, so here's a draft that we can now have under discussion with some of the leading experts in the area's and it's, it's bringing together a kind of diverse group, right? Because I needed human rights people to weigh in. I needed right to house, like human rights writ large people to weigh in. I needed right to housing folks to weigh in. I needed folks with business and human rights background. I needed folks with a finance background. Uh, so I brought together a, a big group of diverse thinkers and got incredible feedback and reworked it. And it was still this massive document. And it became um, clear to me through conversations with people that it would be useful to try to form a discrete sort of advisory council um, of really some of the top thinkers and those who've been most engaged. So I created an advisory council and the very first thing they said to me was, this is good and everything. Nice work, Leilani. It's way too long. No one's going to read it. You've got to you've got to drastically reduce it. So in a two week period, actually, I just kind of turned everything off and I turned it into I, I gave my team and I should say that um, my colleague Sam Freeman co-authored these with me. Um, and there were many other researchers involved, et cetera, all of whom are named in the document. But we we decided, okay, we're going to try to do 10 directives. So we had 20, I think, to begin with. We're going to reduce it to 10 directives, and they're going to be a page each. So uh, we managed to do that. And then we had this incredible opportunity um, through a, a member of European Parliament from the Green Party um, to launch them in 
the European par Parliament. So that expedited the whole process because it was like, okay, June 2nd was the date. We had to have them ready. That's when we were going to go. And so that was the process. And we launched them on June 2nd. And uh, they've been very well received so far. So I'm, I'm super excited. So uh, the ICJ is like quite commonly involved in these processes for the development of expert principles. We kind of currently have several underway. There's more famous uh, historical versions like the Syracuse principles on limitation of rights in public health emergencies. The question always from the outside, I guess, is uh, is there expected? Are we? Is there an expectation or an interest in advocating to get domestic governments uh, around the world, but then also international uh, human rights institutions like uh, the human rights bodies? at an international level to take on and further the work that's being set out in the directives. Yeah, so one of the things that um, we talked about with respect to the directives is like, what what do we, who's the audience and what do, how do we anticipate them being used? Um, and so the audience is really squarely governments and investors and Th that's who we pitch these at. That's who, like there. So, th for listeners or watchers or whatever, um, there's ten directives, and each directive has a little blurb describing the issue at hand, and then a set of recommendations. Normally, around between three and five recommendations, and um, so there's thirty-seven recommendations in all, ten directives, and um, we had those two actors as like the kind of main audience and recognizing however that where investors are concerned there really are some international convenings of investors and where governments are concerned there's some international convenings and so we also anticipated those international entities umbrella organizations etc to be engaged by these um we view the directives as as conversation starters uh provocative conversation starters. Um, they're not easy. What's what's recommended are not, there's no easy fix here. There's, and we, we weren't light in our um, uh, recommendations. Um, you know, we're very clear that governments have to do way more and that they need to lead and that investors have to understand they are engaged in an area that's a human right. And that's going to affect how they conduct their businesses. It must affect how they conduct their business. And so, um, and, and in fact, may push them out, right? If they can't abide by human rights, they perhaps they should leave the sector, right? So th it's very clear. Um, so, so that was the intention. Of course, we know how these things go, don't we, Tim and M Mulesa? <laughs> we know that it will be NGOs and, um, advocates who will take them and run and use them and put them in the face of governments, et cetera. So, so I anticipate that. Uh, I anticipate uh, other iterations of this. I'm already in discussions about um, could we do a version where we distill what city governments should do in particular? Uh, and I'm really looking forward to trying to do that kind of iteration. It might not be a a one for one, like directive one, do this, city should do this. I think it might be just a sort of shorter piece, maybe a three page piece. This is what cities should do based on the directives. Um, and and I, I foresee um, the ability to roll out each directive in different ways and in different places. Yeah, and it's really interesting, actually, the reading through the directives, like uh, the advocacy for the right to the city and for spatial justice it really brings attention to the fact that in international law, our unit of uh, obligation is normally a state without differentiation between the different levels and forms of it. And it becomes more and more apparent over time that, as you're saying, if we don't talk about obligations of local governments, we can't really resolve um, the particularized issues that are, um, are coming up. The last question that I want to ask you is just uh, relating back to the personal introduction you gave. Um, given your personal interest with your father having uh, uh, identified as a person without a home, uh, what kind of emotional impact does it make working on an issue which is about the complete commodification of, of, of the idea of home? And, and do you think that this is like a, a growing sense 
um, that 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 people around the world are feeling like it's becoming impossible to make and have a home. Yes. So, um, first of all, I I've, I've seen a huge. Uh, progression, change, shift from when I was first rapporteur to now and how people are talking about home. Um, so I think it's reached this pitch right now. I think tantamount to the pitch around climate change and the pandemic, to be honest, um, where people are really struggling and fearful about how they're going to survive because of a lack of home, the young people talking to us at the shift about feeling like they, they know that they'll never be able to own anything. Okay. But will they even be able to rent and afford to rent anything in a city where they're actually going to be able to find employment and like a, a real fear around that. Um, and particularly those of course, who don't have parents who are wealthy because that's, that's basically that's it. If you're if you're living in poverty as a child, then you're likely to continue to be living in poverty at this point, uh, because of the the whole way the world is structured, includes including housing systems. Um, so, so I see I see it as a um, it's very top of mind. If you go anywhere, I mean, anywhere. If you go to a bar, if you go to a hairdresser, um, if anywhere, a cafe whatever you're you're in a line up a queue for something what do people talk about housing 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 real estate real estate real estate and 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 it is top of mind in gross ways in my opinion like people you know really happy about how their home has you know tripled in value even though they've done nothing so they're just sitting there and they're so so happy that by doing absolutely not well i guess who wouldn't be happy by doing nothing they've become wealthier. That's pretty nice life. Um, you know, but also people really talking about the struggle of housing. Um, for me, I mean, it's a, it's a super emotional issue. Um, from the point of view, uh, you know, I want to be part of change and I've devoted my life to trying to affect change. And when you get in the thick of this area, you realize, you know, like on the one hand, I'm struggling to help people have a home. And then I'm looking at the forces, like, what am I up against here? What are we up against here? And it's pretty daunting, I have to say that. And for, for, for me, that's emotional, because it means that I'm likely to fail. <laughs> um, or my successes will be small, you know, the way we make change is obviously chipping away. This is incremental. Everything's incremental. So you've got to chip away. And it just seems that these actors have, a, a it's not just that they have economic clout and power. They have a seat at every political table. They're on speed dial for most decision makers in the area of finance uh, and housing. And they are protected by governments and uh, supported by governments. So, and they use their political power to undermine the work of people like us, right? So if we manage to get strides and, um, you know, new legislation being proposed, they'll pour money into having that legislation defeated. And we, we see that time and time again. I mean, of course, the people who've been most successful so far have been the Berliners. So we all eyes on Berlin. And, and folks in Barcelona, um, but Berlin in, in the fact that they managed to have a referendum on um, the idea of the socialization of housing, basically, that's owned by big corporate entities, uh, pro uh, publicly listed companies, and they managed to win their referendum. Um, in other words, in Berlin, more than a million people voted that those big uh, privately listed companies that own thousands of units should actually be compelled to socialize some of their units and a proportion of their units. Not that those units should be purchased at market value by city governments, but that by the city of Berlin, but that that units should be transferred to the city of Berlin and, and be put out as social housing. And 
I mean, that was an incredible win, not just because it was a win, not just because a million people voted, but because they didn't get defeated by the publicly listed uh, corporations that could so easily have used their might and power. And for whatever reason, they weren't able to to defeat this referendum. So, so it, anyway, I don't know if that's answering your question, Tim, but um, it, you're, you're sort of going side to side, so maybe not. <laughs> it's not a question that has an easy answer and you've done a, a very good job of trying. It just struck me while we were talking, but uh, thank you very much for trying to answer. I think I'd also like to pose a, a more personal question uh, to you, Leilani given what you've already said about how exhausting emotionally this kind of advocacy work can be and just you know how difficult it is with all the obstacles that are constantly put in your path so i'd like to know from from you what advice do you have for any activists on the ground students listeners um here present who are interested in advocating for the right house or actively involved in the movement currently what advice would you give to them um for advocating for the right housing in their respective communities hmm. I hate giving advice, I have to admit. <laughs> um, well, uh, I think what I said before is really important. This is a long game. And um, I take inspiration from Indigenous peoples um, in particular. I mean, I happen to live in a country where Indigenous peoples have the worst socioeconomic and political outcomes um, of, of anyone in the country. And so, uh, and yet I see them with their patience and commitment uh, in an ongoing way to just continuing on and saying saying what's right and using human rights as the framework and um, notions of reconciliation, for example, um, which you know the the a concept like reconciliation, as you all know in South Africa, more than most, is not something that happens overnight. And even if there's a, a nice process in place, a truth and reconciliation process um, that it, it, it unfolds over generations. And um, so that's what we have to remember that, that um, this is a long game. I think I've learned over time to take better care of myself. I know that sounds so um, flaky or something, um, but I've worked for a couple of years with a Swedish filmmaker. Some of you will know um, there's a film out there called Push, and it's about the financialization of housing. And if you want to get dirty on this topic, uh, that's a good starting point because it's it's a great film. And I had nothing to do with the making of it, so I'm, I'm only saying it's a great film. I am in the film. I'm the protagonist. But um, it's an easy take on, on the issue. It's an easy way to get interested in financialization. But working with a Swede... Um, opens you to, and, and, and he's a workaholic too, the, the director, Frederick Gerton, but um, there is a way in which um, Swedes do have some understanding of uh, work-life balance or whatever, that that's a terrible expression because anyway, it's a terrible expression. But uh, I think I learned a little bit, um, you know, it's important to take your fika in the afternoon, have a nice cup of coffee and um, restore your energies in whatever way you one restores energy. Um, there's no prescription there. Um, I still don't sleep enough, but um, I do take uh, and all the all the science is coming out now during the pandemic, of course, of the importance of spending time in the natural world. And I do take every morning I walk my dog. I did that before this this uh, event, um, you know, out by the river and just trying to connect with nature to remind myself of sort of perspective. I don't know if that's helpful for anyone. Maybe too flaky. <laughs> I can I can confirm that the push is a very good film. I saw it of all places in 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 Kuala Lumpur and Malaysia with a group of activists there. Oh, you're kidding! They were received there too. Uh, yeah. And and I'm going to take your permission uh, to go for a walk with my dog uh, at a river very soon. Oh, great. <laughs> so not too flaky. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Leilani, um, for providing us with such incredible insights. Um, we're also grateful. To, we're so grateful to you for giving up your time and just really, you know, just openly sharing so much about your your journey and um, how you got to this point. And congratulations on um, the published the public publication of the shift directives. And um, we certainly hope that it will become a useful tool that advocates could also use, but also a great, um, 
a great practical tool for governments and investors to to do better in this area and to shift towards um, human rights based housing. So yeah, thank you so much for providing us with this great pic this this really useful picture on how financialized housing affects people on the ground. I know I've learned a lot from this conversation. I had a very murky idea of what financialization financialized housing is, and I think now you've really very clearly, I think, for me and for the audience, and have given us a great picture of the far reaching effects of it on people on the ground, entire populations even of people, vulnerable people. So thank you very much. And thank you to all of you who have joined us in this conversation. Um, if you have any questions or comments, um, you can leave them um, on our Facebook pages, um, as well as our YouTube channel. Um, feel free to also send through questions um, and um, through our different um, social media platforms. Uh, you can also visit the ICJ website to get a clearer picture of our, um, our work, as well as learn more about Leilani. I think that's a good note to close, uh, close out on this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.